Okay, so this is a table that you have in your book that is actually a really good <coughs> excuse me, comparison between <laughs> bacteria and archaea, eukaryotic cells, and viruses. So you've got the characteristics, nucleic acids. Yes, they're in bacteria. Yes, they're in eukaryotic cells. Yes, they're in vir viruses as far as the genetics go, okay? Um, chromosomes. Yes, we've got them in bacteria and archaea. Yes, we've got them in eukaryotic cells. No, we don't in viruses. So it's kind of a, a good way to sum up who has what and how to kind of compare them, um, who has similar structures. Now, let's talk about the fungi. Um, <clears throat> good news. Fungi are major decomposers in the environment. So dead things, fungi attaches to them and it decomposes them, breaks it apart so that it can become part of the soil, become something that is usable by plants or even sometimes animals. It just depends. But that's a good thing for us because it means we don't have dead things just kind of hanging around for no reason. Fungi are also um, important... They can form important associations with plant roots to help them obtain water and nutrients. I kind of talked about that symbiotic relationship before, where fungi will be on the roots of plants and basically take advantage of what the plant lets go of, and then the plants take advantage of what the fungi lets go of, and each one benefits from that relationship. Fungi are an important part of our diet. Okay, our direct, our, our, our direct diet. Mushrooms are fungi. Um, truffles are fungi. Indirectly, we use yeast for quite a few things. We use it to make bread so that it's light and airy and has bubbles. We also use it to make wine and beer. Yeast help us to ferment those things. Yeast, when it um, takes sugars and breaks them down, Actually, a byproduct, a waste product for them is alcohol, um, ethanol, usually. So as they're eating the sugar from the grape juice, they're making this alcoholic content that also goes into the grape juice. Okay, so just like with bacteria, we have those that are beneficial and those that aren't. Fungi are the same. Bad news. Um, they can cause mycosis which basically are going to be fungal infections, okay? They can be dangerous in the fact that they can cause opportunistic infections. Um, <clears throat> some things are not very infectious, but if your body is already compromised and your immune system is already kind of focused on something else, they can actually infect your body when before they really wouldn't have been able to but it's opportunistic. It takes advantage of the opportunity that it's presented with. Um, they can also be primary um, infections in healthy patients. They can actually be infectious without necessarily just being an opportunistic infection. So let's talk yeasts first as a type of fungi. Normally, yeasts are going to be unicellular, one cell. They're usually round or oval shaped, okay? And they um, <coughs> reproduce through asexual reproduction, meaning if I'm a yeast cell, I'm going to make copies of everything in my cell and split, and you're going to have a clone of what I originally was, okay? That process can be called budding. Okay, um, so it's an asexual form of reproduction. I don't need any other yeast around. I can do it all by myself. But when I do this process, I create a little bud coming off of me that is basically a clone of who I am. Okay, so that's yeast. Again, unicellular, one cell. Filamentous fungi are also known as moles. Okay. This is the fuzzy stuff that you see on top of bread, okay? Um, they are usually multicellular, so more than one cell, and they can be composed of <coughs> long 
filamentous um, pieces called hyphae. Okay. Um, so some fungi are special and can take either form of yeast or filamentous. Okay. And we say that they're dimorphic. Remember, di means two, morph means forms. So they can be, well, they can switch between being this unicellular yeast form or they can become filamentous. Now, something interesting with the hyphae, depending on which fungus you're talking about, um, for example, the non-septa hyphae, it's one continuous branching filament. There are no divisions in between pieces. Whereas the septate hyphae, septum is a division, you actually have pieces that are separated by um, either membrane or cell wall. In this case, it would be membrane. I mean, sorry, cell wall because it's a fungus. So rhizopus would be an example of the non-septate. Um, penicillium is going to be an example of a septate that actually has um, divisions in between. <clears throat> so um, fungal nutrition. Fungi are heterotrophic, okay? Basically, most um, they must acquire food from an organic substrate. They're not photosynthetic. They can't use the sun to get... They have to have something they can grow on top of um, and basically get nutrients from. Fungi, as we said before, are decomposers or saprobic. Um, saprobic. They obtain nutrients from the remnants of dead plants, animals. Um, it penetrates the surface of the substrate. It'll secrete enzymes that break it down and then they can absorb it. So literally I sit on it, I kind of anchor myself down, I start secreting enzymes to start dissolving it and then I pick those up so that I can eat it. Um, some can actually be paras parasitic, meaning they're living off of living plants or living animals. Um, a good example of that would be like ringworm. Ringworm is a fungus, okay? So fungal morphology, remember morph is shape. Um, we've got the filamentous fungi that can have kind of different uh, morphology. Mycelium are inter an intertwining mass of hyphae, remember hyphae are the long pieces, um, that form the body of a mold or a filamentous fungi. You can see that here where you've got all of those thread looking things kind of bundled together. Um, it can have septa, which are basically cross walls, um, where instead of having continuous hyphae, like we saw in the last slide, you've got these um, cross walls that kind of separate them into compartments. Um, you can have the non-septate hypha. Again, there are no cross walls, just one continuous piece. Um, you can have vegetative hyphae, okay? Vegetative hyphae um, are horizontal hyphae in charge of obtaining nutrients. So if I were to compare it to a plant, it would be like the roots that are down in the bottom that are actually secreting the enzymes to absorb the nutrients. However, at the top of this, we have reproductive hyphae. So reproductive hyphae will have um, spores that can spread and basically allow this uh, fungus to reproduce. Um, you'll see this in mushrooms. In mushrooms, if you've ever seen like natural mushrooms out doors, which we have here in South Texas, um, where the fan is underneath the mushroom. If you touch that and then look at your hands, you've got little black dots everywhere. Those are the spores. Okay. Um, reproductive strategies and spores. So spores are one way that we can do asexual reproduction. Another way though, is called asexual fragmentation of the hyphae, of those long strands. It makes an organism that is identical to the original. So 
basically I'm making a clone. Okay. <clears throat> if we're talking about the production of spores, spores are dispersed through the environment. It can be done by the air. If they're light enough, the air can pick them up and move them. It can be done via water. Water can have a current and float them into a new location or even other organisms. So remember I talked about the spores being on your hand if you touch mushrooms. Imagine an animal walking by it and it's on its fur and then it walks further on and some of them fall around the ground that they're walking past. Um, spores, sp bleh, spores germinate in, into a new fungus when finding a favorable substrate to thrive on. So kind of like you, you have to be in the right environment to survive right? I can't put you on the surface of the sun and go, bye, have a good time. No, you would die there. So with the spores, they will not actually make a new fungus until they're in the right place. So if you were to put them down on a very sunny, hot rock, they're probably not going to um, turn into a fungus because there's nothing for it to decompose. There's nothing for it to um, survive on. Okay. Asexual spores, they also produce organisms identical to the single organism producing the spores. Um, we've got sporangio spores um, and condidiospores. Sporangio spores are asexual spores that are normally enclosed in a sac, which you can see, wait, sorry, here. They're actually inside, okay? <clears throat> And this structure is called a sporangium. You actually have to break the sporangium to allow the spores to get free. Condidiospores, okay, which is what this is here, are asexual spores, but notice there's nothing covering them up. There is nothing that you have to break through to get the spores to come out. They're just kind of hanging out on the outside. Now, this is all asexual. It's clones of whatever made the spores here. Sexual spores. They're, produce, they're going to produce an organism that is a combination of traits of two parent fungi. Kind of like when we make a baby, it's a combination of mom and dad. Okay. Um, so it's got the traits of both and it can lead to potentially um, advantageous adaptations. One of the reasons that we like sexual reproduction so much is because it kind of mixes up the genome a little bit and may make something new that is even better at surviving the environment that we are in. Okay. So having the ability to do some type of sexual reproduction with sexual spores might give them a, an advantage in the environment. Now switching gears, the protozoans. Okay, um, they are single-celled organisms with all of the major eukaryotic organelles. So nucleus, mitochondria, rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi, um, the ribosomes, <clears throat> but they are heterotrophic. In other words, they're not photosynthetic. They're not gonna use light to make their um, food. They have to feed off of something. They're heterotrophic, they're different, okay? So when you look at any type of protozoa, they're not gonna have chloroplasts. They're not gonna have any of the little green things. Um, <clears throat> they can be free living or they can be par parasitic. They can live off of somebody. Um, in a normal vegetative cell, in other words, it's alive and it's thriving, we call that a trophozyte, okay? Um, they're modal, they're feeding, um, they're at their feeding stage for a protozoan. Um, and I'll show you the figure in just a minute. With protozoa, you got kind of two options for reproduction. They can reproduce sexually or they can reproduce asexually. It just kind of depends. They are sensitive to the availability of moisture, but they're able to so still survive extreme temperatures and extreme pHs. So it can be really acidic, it can be really basic, but they will be able to survive those situations. 
Okay, when it does come to unfavorable conditions, remember we talked about the bacteria forming spores. So if they get into environments where they're just not happy, in this case, they can form what they call a cyst. The cyst is able to resist those bad conditions and it's again a dormant form of a protozoa. Um, it can resist heat, it can resist drying, it can resist some chemicals and they can be dispersed through air currents. Um, this is really important when it comes to protozoan disease transmission, okay? It allows the organisms like Intamoeba histiolytica and um, Giardia lem lem lamblia, there we go, to be transmitted in water, in food, as they can survive longer outside of favorable conditions. If I go into cyst form and I am on top of, let's say, unwashed lettuce, and you eat that lettuce without washing it, without cooking it, it can transfer to you. Not all protozoans have the ability to form cysts, just like not all bacteria can make spores, okay? Um, Trichomonas vaginalis cannot form a cyst and must be transmitted directly from person to person. Um, basically, Trichomonas can't really survive in bad conditions. If it meets up with bad conditions, it dies because it doesn't have the ability to form this dormant cyst form. So remember, trophocyte means it's active, it's actually living. So here's our trophocyte form, it's active, it's feeding. There's drying in the environment, lack of nutrients in the environment. The cell will actually start to kind of round up instead of looking kind of blobby like that, okay? And it'll start to lose motility and start to form a cyst wall, okay? As it matures, the internal trophocyte is now dormant. It's in its resting stage. The outside has become a mature cyst wall, so it's protective. It's a good way to basically sit inside of a rock cave, I'll say, so that until it finds favorable environment, it's fine. Nothing's going to get in there. It's, it's safe. Now, moisture is restored. I run into nutrients. I'm going to break through that cyst wall and become um, a trophocyte again. I'm going to do my thing where I'm actually eating and producing waste and whatever. This is an electron micrograph of <clears throat> a cyst with its eukaryotic cell emerging. <clears throat> Sorry. So um, the major pathogenic protozoans that you will see, again, this is a table inside of your textbook. So you've got amoeboid protozoans. Um, into amoeba histiolytica is one of them. The disease it causes is amoeba um, physis. It's basically an intestinal disease. It can affect humans. It can be found in water. It can be found in food, okay? Um, a ciliated protozoa would be um, Balantium coli. Um, <clears throat> it causes the disease Balantiodosis. Um, again, it's intestinal. Um, usually you find this in pigs and in cattle. Um, flagellated protozoa, so they've got flagella. You've got Giardia lambia, which causes Giardias, again, intestinal distress. You find it in animals, in water, in food. Um, Apicomplexian protozoa, Plasmodian, Plasmodium vivax. This actually causes malaria. Malaria can cause cardiovascular symptoms. It can cause intestinal symptoms. It's actually kind of multi. Um, it can be human human to human contact, or it can be vector borne where it's on something and it transfers to us. If you want to read more on that, you can look at the table. 
um, but you may want to get acquainted with it. Okay. Now, the helminths. Actually, I'm going to stop. 